Christmases, 67 New Year's, 67 Easter Sundays, 67 Mother's Day, 67 years of counseling with the confused. Ministering to the miserable, afflicting the comfortable, and comforting the afflicted. <laughs> All right. And now the thought of a more excellent way. Yeah. The church, authentic and attractive, now presses upon our consideration. The church of today, repetitious of its past, is reaching for new images of ministry and mission. <laughs> it has been quite some time since our theological seismographs have recorded quakes and tremors which many experts see as not unlike the agitations of the 16th century reformation. Theological fermentation is both exciting and intriguing. Church renewal is in the air. Right. Many are the votes being cast in favor of reshaping the church's structure as an institution. From time to time, the church moves from one set of operating images and working models 
to another. During the latter part of the 18th and the early 19th centuries, the church in America bore the image of the village center. Another image borne by the church during the 19th century was that of missionary to the heathen. During the 19th and early 20th centuries, the church moved into a conception of itself as social servant through the founding of hospitals, orphanages, colleges, social centers, universities, homes for unwed mothers, and a variety of humanitarian programs to care for the destitute, the indigent, and the needy. But these images and working models have undergone a necessary metamorphosis. Wow. Sensing the expendability of structures and the necessity of structure, the planners of this 47th annual L.K. Williams National Ministers Institute have challenged us to turn our thoughts to preserving the authenticity of the church while at the same time maintaining her attractiveness. What is it that makes a Christian church? What is it that makes a church Christian? One of the major New Testament definitions of the church is centered in a concept of this body as the ecclesia and the diaspora, the gathered and scattered people of God. The church in the world, not of the world, but for the world. And this brings me to the text. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 19 and 20, we read, Again, I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. The church authentic and attractive. The conjunction and suggests that we need not sacrifice our authenticity in order to be attractive. For our attractiveness could rest in the fact of our authenticity. And so we need not sacrifice our authenticity in order to be attractive, and we need not throw attractiveness to the wind in order to be authentic. To say that a thing is authentic is to say that it is evidential, 
authoritative, orthodox, genuine, sure, unimitative, undeniable, indisputable, incontrovertible, conclusive, certified, fixed, final, irrefutable, and unimpeachable. To say that a thing is attractive is to say that it is magnetic, charming, delightful, desirable, enticing, enchanting, enrapturing, engaging, bewitching, beautiful, and captivating. In this institute, we have been told and we shall be told through song, sermon, and seminar that there isn't any incompatibility between an informed head and a fervent heart. There isn't any inconsistency between an informed mind and a fervent spirit. We have been told and we shall be told uh, that there isn't uh, any inconsistency between good sense and good religion. An enlightened mind and a burning heart can dwell in the same house on friendly terms. And the church authentic and attractive. The church, the community of the forgiven. The church, God's people among the people. The church, the company of the committee. The church, the colony of heaven. The church, God's plantation. The church, God's husbandry. The church, the fellowship of the concern, the church, God's society within society, the church, the worshiping community, the church, a community of faith, the church, the safe God of the personal dimension against technological encroachment. The church, the uncompromising exponent of personhood in contradistinction to things who. The church, heaven's vehicle through which God has chosen to reach the world. The church, the context in which people can face the full dimension of their lives, their needs, their ways, and their creative powers. The church, the image of the true society, the holy nation, and the new creation. The church. The extension of the incarnation. The church is challenged today as never before. The church is challenged to present her credentials anew. Moral values are shifting and 
old beliefs are being called in question. Old ways have been done away and the new ways have not yet been clearly marked out. In a world that has lived by the sword for thousands of years, and that has known more war casualties in the 20th century than in all previous centuries combined. In such a world, war is no longer a permissible luxury, no longer a defensible strength. In a world where hunger and starvation are present realities, where two-thirds of the earth's people will go to bed hungry tonight, the demand for economic justice will not be signed. In a world where colonialism, wearing many faces, has exploited Asia, Africa, and Latin America, American and European coercive intrusion will no longer be tolerated. In a world that has bent low under the curse of racism, the man of color will be heard, he will be free, he will determine his own destiny, he will overcome. In a world that has heard the church talk about love and practice hate, in a world that has heard the church preach unity and practice division uh, for thousands of years of growing skepticism and indifference demand that we put up or shut Quincy Howe once wrote the 20th century has put the human race on trial for its life. Within this larger courtroom drama, the church is on trial for its life as it should be. It is crucially important that the church should preserve her authenticity and attractiveness. All right. All right. The church stands on the judgment of God and history. And she must maintain her attractiveness by changing her structure. She must preserve her authenticity by maintaining her force. She must maintain her attractiveness by changing her form. She must preserve her authenticity by maintaining her message. She must maintain her attractiveness by changing her method. She must preserve her authenticity Yes. By maintaining her objectives, she must maintain her attractiveness by seeking new ways and means of reaching her objectives. In the first 22 verses of the 18th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus talks about the foundation of the church. He talks about the mystery of the cross and the transfigured Christ in the heart of him. He talks about the life of self-denial. He talks about family life, marriage, and divorce. He talks about the place of little children within the church. 
bring the life of reconciliation and prayer among his followers. Three are gathered there am I in the midst of them. What is it that constitutes the church? When we gather for worship, sing our hymns, have our devotions, and make our offerings. All that is deeply significant and essential. Mm -hmm. But what is it that constitutes constitutes the church the best of you to eternity what is it that constitutes the church the new creation what is it that constitutes the church the custodian of the curriculum what is it that constitutes the church the precipitator of moral and spiritual innovation what is it that constitutes the church as the servant of God and the servant of man, combining the mechanics of organization and the dynamic of organism? What is it that constitutes the church, the scrutinizer of the signs of the time in the life of the gospel? What is it that constitutes the church? the evangelistic community, the summoning community, yes, what is it that constitutes the heart and substance of the church? I believe this question is answered in the text, where two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of me. The very essence of the church is found in that I am of the living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wherever he is present and worshipped, there is the church. Without his presence, there is no church. Without his presence, there is no authenticity. Without his presence, there is no attraction. Well, what did Jesus mean by meeting in his name? You know, my brothers and sisters, one's name is important. One's name is meaningful. One's name is significant. Yes. Uh, since a stinker knocked on a door as the story goes and the mother came to the door and the lady who was taking census asked her, yes, uh, how many children do you have? And the mother began to name them one by one. And the lady who was taking senses got a little impatient and said, I don't need the names. I just want the number. And the mother said, they got numbers. They got names. His name, he reveals his identity. 
Yes. When one gives his name, he brings up family background. When one gives his name, he brings up the question of history. Well, God revealed the I am this to Moses at the backside of the desert. When he told him, I am that I am. Jesus revealed his I am this in the text. For you see, his I am this sprang from his eternal is next. What does it mean to meet in the name of Jesus? To meet in his name means to meet in his spirit. To meet in his name means to meet with his attitude. To meet in his name means to meet with trembling aspirations and heavenly expectations. To meet in his name is to meet with minds and hearts attuned to his word. To meet in his name is to meet with a willingness to render, yes, I will do unto him. To meet in his name means to meet with a willingness to surrender ourselves to his word, his will, and his way. And to meet in his name means to be met by him. When we meet in his But in the midst of us, not outside looking on, but in the midst of us, Jesus Christ is the founder and foundation of the church. She is authentic because she has the right founder. And she is authentic because she has the right foundation. She is attractive because she has the right presence. When Christ, yes, is there, he makes the difference. When the church meets in his name, we have his word that he will be there. And my brothers and sisters, I don't know how you feel about it, but when I go to church, I want him to be there, for you see, if he doesn't come, yes, I'll go away without benefit. His presence makes the difference. His presence brings heaven down our souls to meet. His presence causes glory to crown the mercy seat. His presence makes the difference between a church and a crowd. His presence makes the difference between a church and a social club. His presence makes the difference between spirituality and formality. His presence makes the difference between the official and the unofficial. His presence changes us from our midgets 
to spiritual giants. His presence changes us from apologists to apostles. His presence makes a difference. The name of Christ and the presence of Christ go together. There is power in his name. There is power in his presence. In spite of the morticians of the absolute and the pseudo-sophisticated embalmers of the supernatural, when we gather in his name, we are in the arena where the matchless, the marvelous, and the miraculous can take place. When we gather in his name, yes, we are in the atmosphere where wonderful things can take place. Throughout the New Testament, in the name of Christ, describe the sphere where wonders take place. In his name, the sick are healed. In his name, lame ones were made to walk. In his name, yeah, deaf ones were made to hear. The blind were made to see. In his name, the dead were made to live again. When we truly gather in his name, he is there. Well, what is he doing there? He is there redeeming. He is there forgiving. He is there restoring. He is there healing. He is there recreating his future. When we truly gather in his name, he is there activating salvation, redemption, and sanctification. When we truly gather in his name, he is there alive, mediating the mighty acts of God in history and in our midst. Think now, as I must hurry to the close, think now about the way in which Christ comes into our midst. Christ in our midst is Christ for us. Christ came to the world for us. Christ took our place. Christ stepped into the delicate gap between a commanding God and a disobeying man. Christ stood in the gap between a faithful God and an unfaithful man. Between a righteous God and a wicked man. Christ for us was divinity, tabernacling within humanity. Christ for us was the eternal one born within the context of time. Christ for us, yes, by entering into complete solidarity with sinful man. He, the Holy One, took man's place before God so that where we, the unjust, yes, have to stand and should have stood, Christ stood for us, the just for the unjust. In, in Him, yes, our place was taken. He did not come to judge us nor to condemn us. He did not come, uh, yes, to cast us aside. He came 
to take our place on the judgment and in so doing to gather us back into the life of God because it is God himself who came in Jesus Christ to take man's place and man's status on himself. Man is not sheltered from God but exposed to the judgment of God's love and bound to God by a bond of forgiveness forged in the death of the incarnate son which while it judges the sin releases the sinner and reconciles him to God Christ in our midst is not only Christ for us but Christ in our midst is Christ in us Christ is not content Yes, wants to have died for us and to have taken our place on the cross. He offers to live within each one of us individually. He offers to live in me. He offers to live in you. I'm so glad that he lived in me. So the life I now live is not mine, but Christ lives in me. Yes, Lord, He offers to live in us. He comes to dwell in us through His Word. His Word is truth. His Word is life. His Word is light. If Christ would be in us and in our midst in the church. We must hear his word. We must accept his word. We must feast on his word. We must live by his word. Jesus said, if a man loves me, he will keep my word. We love him and we will come in unto him and make our abode with him. Christ will come in if we make room. So many of us, yes, we make room for him. But if you make room, he will come in. Yes. If I was in revival now, I would tell the sinner, oh, make room. Yes. Let the Lord come in. If you make room, he will come in. Yes, Lord. Make room for him in your life. But when you make out the order, make room for him. Yes, Lord. Well, when he comes in, yeah, you can hold sweet fellowship with him. When he comes in, he will strengthen. When he comes in, he God, when he comes in, he will energize, make room for him, yes, Lord, come, yes, to Christ right now, well, in closing now, almost the last words of Jesus to his disciples, contained an assurance of his companionship and praise. Go ye, teach and baptize, and then teach 
some more. And lo, I'm with you always. Comes in our need. Means Christ for us. Christ in us. And Christ with us. Yeah. We have the assurance of the with usness of Christ. Where two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of them. The church gathers in his name. The church gathers for worship. The church gathers for renewal. The church gathers for restoration. The church gathers for reassignment. The church gathers for redirection. The church gathers to take moral and spiritual inventory. The church comes in to worship and goes out to witness and to work. Well, the church attractive in worship, the church attractive in witness, the church attractive in work, yeah, working in witnessing and worshiping parts of one whole, each enhances the other, each makes meaningful the other, each complements the other, well, yeah, what about the future of the church? I hear so many prophets of doom and pillars of dismay prophesying yeah, the ultimate failure of the church. Yeah, but I don't worry about that. I hear Jesus saying, upon this rock, I will build my church in the gates of hell, shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell, the powers of darkness have been battling against the church for no these many years. The church had had her ups and downs, but the old ship is still intact. The old ship is still crying. The waters of the ocean of time. I hear somebody saying, "If the old ship is gone, she has landed."
utopia if Plato could have his republic if Henry David Thoreau could have his world town it ought to be alright for the saints to have the final power I hear Jesus say Footsteps until I die. 